Gabrielle Emily Le Tonnelier de Bretoy, Marquise du Châtelet, French pronunciation, Emily Di Tiel, listen, the 17th of December 1706 to the 10th of September 1749, was a French natural philosopher, mathematician, physicist, and author during the early 1730s until her untimely death due to childbirth in 1749. Her most recognized achievement is her translation of and commentary on Isaac Newton's book Principia containing basic laws of physics. The translation, published posthumously in 1759, is still considered the standard French translation today. Her commentary includes a profound contribution to Newtonian mechanics, the postulate of an additional conservation law for total energy, of which kinetic energy of motion is one element. Her philosophical magnum opus, Institutions de Physique Paris, 1740, first edition, or Foundations of Physics, circulated widely, generated heated debates, and was republished and translated into several other languages within two years of its original publication. She participated in the famous vis viva debate, concerning the best way to measure the force of a body and the best means of thinking about conservation principles. Posthumously, her ideas were heavily represented in the most famous text of the French Enlightenment, the Encyclopédie of Denis Diderot and Jean Le Rond d'Alembert, first published shortly after Du Châtelet's death. Numerous biographies, books and plays have been written about her life and work in the two centuries since her death. In the early 21st century, her life and ideas have generated renewed interest. Contribution to philosophy In addition to producing famous translations of works by authors such as Bernard Mandeville and Isaac Newton, Du Châtelet wrote a number of significant philosophical essays, letters and books that were well known in her time. Because of her well-known collaboration and romantic involvement with Voltaire, which spanned much of her adult life, for generations Du Châtelet has been known as mistress and collaborator to her much better known intellectual companion. Her accomplishments and achievements have often been subsumed under his, and as a result, even today she is often mentioned only within the context of Voltaire's life and work during the period of the early French Enlightenment. Recently, however, professional philosophers and historians have transformed the reception of Du Châtelet. Historical evidence indicates that Du Châtelet's work had a very significant influence on the philosophical and scientific conversations of the 1730s and 1740s, in fact, she was famous and respected by the greatest thinkers of her time. Du Châtelet corresponded with renowned mathematicians such as Johann Tu Bernoulli and Leonard Euler, early developers of calculus. She was also tutored by Bernoulli's prodigy students, Pierre-Louis Moreau de Maupertuis and Alexis-Claude Clairaut. Frederick the Great of Prussia, who refounded the Academy of Sciences in Berlin, was her great admirer, and corresponded with both Voltaire and Du Châtelet regularly. He introduced Du Châtelet to Leibniz's philosophy by sending her the works of Christian Wolff, and Du Châtelet sent him a copy of her institutions. Her works were published and republished in Paris, London, and Amsterdam, they were translated into German and Italian, and, they were discussed in the most important scholarly journals of the era, including the Memoirs des Trévoux, the Journal des Scavens, the Göttingische Zeitungen von Gelehrten Sachsen, and others. Perhaps most intriguingly, many of her ideas were represented in various sections of the Encyclopédie of Diderot and D'Alembert, and some of the articles in the Encyclopédie are a direct copy of her work. This is an active area of current academic research. The latest research can be found at Project Vox, a Duke University research initiative. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Biography. Early life Emily du Châtelet was born on 17 December 1706 in Paris, the only girl amongst six children. Three brothers lived to adulthood, René Alexander b. 1698, Charles Auguste b. 1701, and Elizabeth Théodore b. 1710. Her eldest brother, René Alexander, died in 1720, and the next brother, Charles Auguste, died in 1731. However, her younger brother, Elizabeth Théodore, lived to a successful old age, becoming an abbé and eventually a bishop. Two other brothers died very young. 
Du Châtelet also had an illegitimate half-sister, Michelle, who was born of her father and Anne Bellanzani, an intelligent woman who was interested in astronomy and married to an important Parisian official. Her father was Louis Nicolas Le Tonnelier de Bretoy, a member of the lesser nobility. At the time of Du Châtelet's birth, her father held the position of the principal secretary and introducer of ambassadors to King Louis XIV. He held a weekly salon on Thursdays, to which well-respected writers and scientists were invited. Her mother was Gabrielle Anne de Frolet, Baron de Bretoy. <laughs> Early education Du Châtelet's education has been the subject of much speculation, but nothing is known with certainty. Among their acquaintances was Fontanelli, the perpetual secretary of the French Académie des Sciences. Du Châtelet's father Louis Nicolas, recognizing her early brilliance, arranged for Fontanelli to visit and talk about astronomy with her when she was ten years old. Du Châtelet's mother, Gabrielle Anne de Froulet, was brought up in a convent, at the time the predominant educational institution available to French girls and women. While some sources believe her mother did not approve of her intelligent daughter, or of her husband's encouragement of Émilie's intellectual curiosity, there are also other indications that her mother not only approved of Du Châtelet's early education, but actually encouraged her to vigorously question stated fact. In either case, such encouragement would have been seen as unusual for parents of their time and status. When she was small, her father arranged training for her in physical activities such as fencing and riding, and as she grew older, he brought tutors to the house for her. As a result, by the age of 12 she was fluent in Latin, Italian, Greek and German. She was later to publish translations into French of Greek and Latin plays and philosophy. She received education in mathematics, literature, and science. Her mother Gabrielle Anne was horrified at her progress and fought Louis Nicolas at every step, once attempting to have Emily sent to a convent. Du Châtelet's also liked to dance, was a passable performer on the harpsichord, sang opera, and was an amateur actress. As a teenager, short of money for books, she used her mathematical skills to devise highly successful strategies for gambling. Marriage On 12 June 1725, she married the Marquis Florent Claude du Chastelet Lomont. Her marriage conferred the title of Marquise du Chastelet. Like many marriages among the nobility, theirs was arranged. As a wedding gift, the husband was made governor of Seymour and Auxois in Burgundy by his father. The recently married couple moved there at the end of September 1725. Du Châtelet was 18 at the time, her husband 34. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Children. The Marquis Florent Claude du Chastelet and Emily du Chatelet had three children: Françoise Gabriel Pauline, born the 30th of June 1726; Louis Marie Florent, born the 20th of November 1727; and Victor Esprit, born the 11th of April 1733. Victor Esprit died as an infant in late summer 1734, likely the last Sunday in August. On 4 September 1749 Émilie du Châtelet gave birth to Stanislas Adelaide du Châtelet daughter of Jean-François de Saint-Lambert. She died as an infant in Luneville on 6 May 1751. Resumption of studies In 1733, aged 26, du Châtelet resumed her mathematical studies. Initially, she was tutored in algebra and calculus by Moreau de Maupertuis, a member of the Academy of Sciences. Although mathematics was not his forte, he had received a solid education from Johann Bernoulli, who also taught Leonard Euler. However, by 1735, Du Châtelet had turned for her mathematical training to Alexis Clairaut, a mathematical prodigy known best for Clairaut's equation and Clairaut's theorem. Du Châtelet resourcefully sought some of France's best tutors and scholars to mentor her in mathematics. On one occasion at the Café Gradot, a place where men frequently gathered for intellectual discussion, she was politely ejected when she attempted to join one of her teachers. Undeterred, she simply had some men's clothing made for herself and strolled back in drag. Topic: Relationship with Voltaire. 
Du Chatelet may have met Voltaire in her childhood at one of her father's salons. Voltaire himself dates their meeting to 1729, when he returned from his exile in London. However, their friendship developed from May 1733 when she re entered society after the birth of her third child. Du Chatelet invited Voltaire to live at her country house at Cerise sur Blaise in Haute Marne, northeastern France, and he became her longtime companion under the eyes of her tolerant husband. There she studied physics and mathematics and published scientific articles and translations. To judge from Voltaire's letters to friends and their commentaries on each other's work, they lived together with great mutual liking and respect. As a literary rather than scientific person, Voltaire implicitly acknowledged her contributions to his 1738 Elements of the Philosophy of Newton, where the chapters on optics show strong similarities with her own essay Sur l'Optique. She was able to contribute further to the campaign by a laudatory review in the Journal des Savants, sharing a passion for science. Voltaire and Du Chatelet collaborated scientifically. They set up a laboratory in Du Chatelet's home. In a healthy competition, they both entered the 1738 Paris Academy Prize contest on the nature of fire, since Du Chatelet disagreed with Voltaire's essay. Although neither of them won, both essays received honorable mention and were published. She thus became the first woman to have a scientific paper published by the Academy. Topic: <laughs> Social life after living with Voltaire. Du Chatelet's relationship with Voltaire caused her to give up most of her social life to become more involved with her study in mathematics with the teacher of Pierre Louis Moreau de Maupertuis. He introduced the ideas of Isaac Newton to her. Letters written by Du Chatelet explain how she felt during the transition from Parisian socialite to rural scholar, from one life to the next. Topic: <laughs> Final pregnancy and death. In May 1748, Du Chatelet began an affair with the poet Jean-François de Saint Lambert and became pregnant. In a letter to a friend she confided her fears that she would not survive her pregnancy. On the night of 4 September 1749 she gave birth to a daughter, Stanislas Adelaide. Du Chatelet died on 10 September 1749, at Luneville, from a pulmonary embolism. She was 42. Her daughter died 20 months later. Topic. Scientific research and publications Topic. Criticizing Locke and the debate on thinking matter In her writing, Du Chatelet criticizes John Locke's philosophy. She emphasizes the necessity of the verification of knowledge through experience. Locke's idea of the possibility of thinking matter is, abstruse. Her critique on Locke originates in her Bernard de Mandeville commentary on the fable of the bees. She confronts us with her resolute statement in favor of universal principles which precondition human knowledge and action, and maintains that this kind of law is innate. Du Chatelet claims the necessity of a universal presupposition, because if there is no such beginning, all our knowledge is relative. In that way, Du Chatelet rejects John Locke's aversion of innate ideas and a priori principles. She also reverses Locke's negation of the principle of contradiction, which would constitute the basis of her methodic reflections in the institutions. On the contrary, she affirms her arguments in favor of the necessity of a priori and universal principles. Two and two could then make as well four as six. If a priori principles did not exist, Pierre Louis Moreau de Maupertuis and Julien Offray de la Maitrie's reference to Du Chatelet's deliberations on motion and free will, on thinking matter and numbers, and on the way to do metaphysics indicate the importance of her reflections. She rebuts the claim to finding truth by using mathematical laws, and argues against Maupertuis. <laughs> Heat and light In 1737 Chatelet published a paper entitled Dissertation sur la nature et la propagation du feu, based upon her research into the science of fire, that predicted what is today known as infrared radiation and the nature of light. <laughs> <laughs> Institutions de physique Her book Institutions de physique, Lessons in Physics 
was published in 1740. It was presented as a review of new ideas in science and philosophy to be studied by her 13 year old son, but it incorporated and sought to reconcile complex ideas from the leading thinkers of the time. The book and subsequent debate contributed to her becoming a member of the Academy of Sciences of the Institute of Bologna in 1746. Forces vives In 1741 Du Châtelet published a book titled Réponse de Madame la Marquise du Chastelet, à la lettre K. M. de Marin. Dordis de Marin, secretary of the Academy of Sciences, had published a set of arguments addressed to her regarding the appropriate mathematical expression for forces vives. Du Châtelet presented a spirited point by point rebuttal of de Marin's arguments, causing him to withdraw from the controversy. Immanuel Kant's first publication in 1747 zur Waren der Kraft focuses on Du Châtelet's pamphlet against the secretary of the French Academy of Sciences, Marin. Kant's opponent, Johann Augustus Eberhard, accused Kant of taking ideas from Du Châtelet. Advocacy of kinetic energy Although in the early 18th century the concepts of force and momentum had been long understood, the idea of energy as transferable between different systems was still in its infancy, and would not be fully resolved until the 19th century. It is now accepted that the total mechanical momentum of a system is conserved and none is lost to friction. Simply put, there is no momentum friction and momentum cannot transfer between different forms, and particularly there is no potential momentum. Emmy Noether proved this to be true for all problems where the initial state is symmetric in generalized coordinates. Mechanical energy, kinetic and potential, may be lost to another form, but the total is conserved in time. The Du Châtelet contribution was the hypothesis of the conservation of total energy, as distinct from momentum. Inspired by the theories of Gottfried Leibniz, she repeated and publicized an experiment originally devised by Willem S. Gravesand in which balls were dropped from different heights into a sheet of soft clay. Each ball's kinetic energy, as indicated by the quantity of material displaced, was shown to be proportional to the square of the velocity. The deformation of the clay was found to be directly proportional to the height the balls were dropped from, equal to the initial potential energy. Earlier workers, such as Newton and Voltaire, had all believed that energy, so far as they understood the concept at all, was indistinct from momentum and therefore proportional to velocity. According to this understanding, the deformation of the clay should have been proportional to the square root of the height from which the balls were dropped. In classical physics the correct formula is E K equals 1 2 M V two display style e underscore k equals frac one two m v caret two, where e k display style e underscore k is the kinetic energy of an object m display style m, its mass and v display style v its speed, energy must always have the same dimensions in any form, which is necessary to be able to relate it in different forms kinetic, potential, heat. Newton's work assumed the exact conservation of only mechanical momentum. A broad range of mechanical problems are soluble only if energy conservation is included. The collision and scattering of two-point masses is one of them. Leonard Euler and Joseph Louis Lagrange established a more formal framework for mechanics using the results of Duchatelet. Topic. Translation and commentary on Newton's Principia In 1749, the year of Du Châtelet's death, she completed the work regarded as her outstanding achievement, her translation into French, with her commentary, of Newton's Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica often referred to as simply the Principia, including her derivation of the notion of conservation of energy from its principles of mechanics. Published ten years after her death, today Du Châtelet's translation of the Principia is still the standard translation of the work into French. Indeed, her translation and commentary of the Principia also contributed to the completion of the scientific revolution in France and to its acceptance in Europe. <laughs> 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 
Topic: Other contributions. Topic: Development of financial derivatives. She lost the considerable sum for the time of 84,000 francs, some of it borrowed, in one evening at the table at the court of Fontainebleau, to card cheats. To raise the money to pay back her debts she devised an ingenious financing arrangement similar to modern derivatives, whereby she paid tax collectors a fairly low sum for the right to their future earnings they were allowed to keep a portion of the taxes they collected for the king, and promised to pay the court gamblers part of these future earnings. Topic. Biblical scholarship Du Chatelet wrote a critical analysis of the entire Bible. A synthesis of her remarks on the Book of Genesis was published in English in 1967 by Ira O. Wade of Princeton in his book Voltaire and Madame du Chatelet. An essay on intellectual activity at Surrey and a book of her complete notes was published in 2011, in the original French, edited and annotated by Bertram Eugene Schwartzbach. Topic. Discourse on happiness Du Chatelet wrote a monograph, Discours sur le bonheur, on the nature of happiness both in general and specialized to women. Topic. Translation of the Fable of the Bees, and other works Du Chatelet translated the Fable of the Bees in a free adaptation. She also wrote works on optics, rational linguistics, and the nature of free will. Topic: <laughs> Support of women's education. In her first independent work, the preface to her translation of the Fable of the Bees, Du Chatelet argues strongly for women's education, particularly a strong secondary education as was available for young men in the French colleges. By denying women a good education, she argues, society prevents women from becoming eminent in the arts and sciences. <inaudible> Legacy Du Chatelet made a crucial scientific contribution in making Newton's historic work more accessible in a timely, accurate and insightful French translation, augmented by her own original concept of energy conservation. A main belt minor planet and a crater on Venus have been named in her honor, and she is the subject of three plays, Legacy of Light by Karen Zacharias, Emily, La Marquise du Châtelet Defends Her Life Tonight by Lauren Gunderson and Urania, The Life of Emily du Châtelet by J. Y. L. Bonaguro. The opera Emily of Kaya Sariaho is about the last moments of her life. Du Châtelet is often represented in portraits with mathematical iconography, such as holding a pair of dividers or a page of geometrical calculations. In the early 19th century, a French pamphlet of celebrated women femmes célèbres introduced a possibly apocryphal story of Du Châtelet's childhood. According to this story, a servant fashioned a doll for her by dressing up wooden dividers as a doll, however, Du Châtelet undressed the dividers and intuiting their purpose, made a circle with them. Works <laughs> <laughs> Scientific dissertation sur la nature et la propagation du feu, first edition, 1739, second edition, 1744. Institutions de physique, first edition, 1740, second edition, 1742. Principes mathématiques de la philosophie naturelle par feu Madame la Marquise du Châtelet, first edition, 1756, second edition, 1759. Other examen de la genèse. Examen des livres du Nouveau Testament Discours sur le bonheur See also Timeline of women in science Notes